why don't I start with uh, Farida Bena, who's joined us from the International Rescue Committee. She's the Director of Humanitarian Policy and Advocacy since 2017. And she brings 20 years of experience in programming and policy, and particular focus on accountability and, uh, and aid effectiveness. And prior to, right, to working at the RICRC, she's worked with various other organizations and NGOs, OECD, CARE, the European Commission, Oxfam, etc. Right here next to me is Maria Luz Biazafini Kamia, who's with our GIMDAC department in, uh, center in Berlin. She's one of the impact evaluation officers we have in an IOM, and we don't have that many, so it's, it's a pleasure to, to have her with us. Uh, Maria Luz joined IOM just over a year ago, and she's working primarily on using experimental and quasi-experimental impact evaluation methods. Prior to joining IOM, she's done program management and research assistant, focusing primarily on data collection and analysis in, in various countries across Asia and Africa. Then we have Kilian Nolan, who's joining us from the uh, uh, Abdul Latif Jamil uh, Poverty Action Lab, JPAL, as the Associate Director here in the European Office in Paris. And he helps to, me to manage the JPAL network looking at rigorous impact evaluations on vi violence and conflict resolution, or sorry, reduction, excuse me. Prior to joining JPAL, he worked also with the International Crisis Group as well as a policy analyst for conflict. And last but not least, we have Kristen McCollin, who's joining us from WFP as an evaluation analyst. And she coordinates a portfolio of impact evaluation on cash-based transfers as well as gender. And prior to joining <coughs> WFP, uh, Kristen was working also with 3IE, the International Initiative for Impact Evaluation, as well as E5 and, and Oxfam Great Britain. So once again, welcome to the four of you. It's nice to have you all with us today. Before I start asking questions to the panelists, I have two questions and I hope people can be candid. But ultimately, we knew that we would have a mixed group of people in this audience. And it would be interesting for us, and hopefully for, for us to, in terms of how we engage in this discussion, to A, just get a quick poll. If you can just raise your hand, I won't, I won't call on you, I promise. But one, if you've already envisioned how within the context of your own work, how you think you could use impact evaluation. If you can just, great, okay. Okay, pretty good. And if maybe you can ask those to, to just put number one, if they feel, for those that are on the webinar. And the last question, and again, no judgment, but it's important for us to know, if you're still a bit unsure as to whether impact evaluation is realistic within the context of your work. Okay. Very few people, that's great. I think we can all go home then. <laughs> Perfect. So again, if those in the, in the panel, if they can give us a potential two, just to gauge the, the interest and the knowledge and, and just how people are feeling about impact evaluation. Um, so that hopefully gives you a sense as well of where our audience is today. But because we, we do want to try to get through our questions, what I'd like to do is start with our first question which is trying to look at the benefits of impact evaluation and how the approach has contributed to advances in your work. And potentially, because of, of time, if you could just you talk a little bit about what your work is when trying to answer that question. Maybe we can start off with uh, very with on this. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for inviting me, and uh, um, good morning to everybody. Uh, good afternoon. Um, Yes, I think it's important before I reply to your question to explain a little bit what um, IRC, uh, International Rescue Committee, does. Um, our mission is basically to help the people affected by crisis to do three things. First of all, most important, to survive, um, to recover, and hopefully regain control over their lives. Uh, we like to call the people we serve our clients. It's a provocative term that we use because we reject the notion of beneficiaries. These people do not necessarily just passively benefit from our intervention, but we want our clients to be active in um, choosing how to respond to our intervention 
and also voicing their concern. So client voice and client choice for us are um, paramount. Um, we operate um, across the full arc of the crisis from the emergency response to recovery to development. And for us, impact evaluations are key to understanding the effectiveness of what we do. Um, the impact evaluation for us uh, responds to the primary question, are we doing a good job? Is this actually working? And more importantly, why? We find that a lot of the monitoring activities that we carry out actually focus on the what. What are we doing? Where are we at? What's happening? But rarely do we, and I can say also the humanitarian community takes the time to actually reflect on the why. Why are we doing what we do? Why do we continue doing what we do? Um, and um, invariably, this why question is, um, in our opinion, ignored. And IRC has, we believe, made an important contribution to impact evaluations because out of what we have counted as um, 171 high quality impact evaluations carried out since 2006. We have conducted 39 of those and uh, we have 18 more in the pipeline. Mm -hmm. So uh, among the humanitarian implementing agencies, IRC has made the largest contribution to impact evaluations and we're happy about that. But we also think that impact evaluations um, to respond to some uh, critics, um, do not really answer all of the why question. I mean, you need a specific context that you need to um, have, in a way, an ideal context to carry out uh, rigorous impact evaluations. And sometimes there are factors that you simply cannot measure. So I don't know who says said this, but not everything that counts can be counted. Yeah. Not everything that is counted actually counts, and it is so true. We, we work in some of the most <laughs> complex contexts around the world, um, crisis-affected countries, people that are in protracted crisis on average for 17 years. Uh, so there's bound to be factors that really escape uh, in rigorous impact evaluations. And I think one of the um, uh, greatest learnings uh, that we've made is to, to realize, to recognize that there's only so much we can measure and there's so much we simply don't know. So in a way the challenge now is how do we try to measure or at least understand what we cannot measure through impact evaluations alone. Thank you. Um, maybe jumping on that and potentially going to Kristin next, if you can also talk about the benefits of impact evaluation, but also looking at what Farida mentioned about where it may not actually be the best way of trying to measure and learn from, and what the experience has been in WFP when developing impact evaluation. Mm -hmm. um, so WFP has a lot of parallels with IRC in that we also um, are a humanitarian organization in many contexts and working in tricky situations like that. Our interventions are almost always household based and so that actually lends itself really well to impact evaluation. I think um, where we find it useful is, is testing these assumptions, this use of or this rejection of the term beneficiary I think highlights it really well that that itself is, is an assumption. Are they actually benefiting? Um, so we use impact evaluation to test that assumption but then also contribute to these questions about why. Adding to that, we, we, when we speak about impact evaluation, we always say, and for whom? And so when you have the sample size or you know, when you have uh, the time to design this kind of study, then it's also really interesting to be able to tease out what ages or what, what uh, genders or who exactly is benefiting and who needs extra support. And, and I think that's in all contexts, but part particularly in the context of humanitarian interventions is a very important question to, to be asking. Um, my job is entirely impact evaluation, so I'm probably not best placed to speak okay. about when it's <laughs> not useful, but um, there, are, there are conversations that we've had with country offices um, when they have important questions about institutional capacity, uh, when they're talking about resilience building, trying to 
to kind of bridge that gap between what happens after a disaster, how do we make sure that you know, we can prevent it from being um, so, so grave in the future. That kind of institutional level um, capacity building is something that uh, makes a lot of sense for other types of evaluations. And also getting a sense of, you know, the entirety of a, of a country's activities, um, where impact evaluation would focus on a particular intervention and the mechanics of a particular intervention. If you want to learn broader lessons about uh, how a country does, a, you know, a country program does what it does, then that requires uh, different types. And so, as was mentioned this morning, obviously this is something that uh, complements itself rather than is, is at odds with each other, I think. Okay, thank you. Maybe we can jump over to you, Kitty, and if you could speak a bit about what JPAL does and, and the use of that of all of the, the whether impact evaluation that you research and how you're learning from that or potentially where you find that you might have to actually get that information from different sources of, of evaluations or research. Sure. So as you mentioned, JPAL is the Abdul Latif Jamil Poverty Action Lab. Um, it's a network of professors, over about 180 professors who are affiliated around the world in different universities and then a staff that works with those professors to work primarily on randomized control. So like you, Kristen, sort of my focus is on rigorous impact evaluation but I can talk about how other methods sort of complement this research. Um, I think some of the most exciting ways in which it's grown, the network was founded in 2003. We have now either completed or are working on over a thousand randomized evaluations across 10 different sectors. So some of those that were maybe the best known in the beginning were agriculture, looking at the adoption of new technologies, health on questions like preventative uh, health products and pricing. Is it important to charge a, a price for something or is it better to, to hand it out for free if you're looking at uptake and uptake is what matters or, or reducing incidence of, of disease. And then with education I guess would be another classic field looking at best ways of ensuring that pe uh, students don't end up only in school but actually learn things. Um, and then we've expanded into new areas. So as you mentioned, one of the areas that I've been involved in has been uh, experimental research on crime and conflict, uh, on issues like policing, but also dispute resolution, uh, trying to find ways to reduce uh, conflict in, in different ways. Um, we've now set up a new uh, net, um, sector on firms, which focuses on the role that firms play in even management practices within firms and sort of how that affects individuals' welfare, but also sort of their take-home earnings. Uh, and then also our new sector is on gender, sort of looking at uh, particularly this question of Yasser mentioned it earlier, heterogeneous effects, or as you were saying, sort of how uh, different programs might have different effects for different people and looking at particularly issues of women's empowerment. So across all of those, I think this question of measurement is a really interesting one. It's one where you don't need to do a randomized control trial to sort of invest in interesting measurement practices, but I think it pushes you a little bit in that way. Um, Jasper and Felipe were talking about some of the challenges of collecting this information and thinking about how we measure it, uh, making some sort of cost effectiveness choices about what are the best ways to measure it given that this can be quite expensive method of evaluation. How do we make sure that we learn the most that we can with limited resources? Um, and I think measuring some things that we thought maybe weren't measurable before. So I think about a lot of the work that's done in the sector I work on around issues such as social capital or the bonds that keep communities together. Some of these questions that people are researching right now about whether increasing social capital is an effective bulwark against conflict, particularly the resumption of conflict in areas that it's happened before. So thinking about how we measure that, it seems like kind of a fuzzy concept. People might be able to put their finger on it. We might be able to sort of talk about survey responses. Do you think there's a lot of social capital here? That's not a question that's gonna gel for many people. So sort of one study that comes to mind was in Sierra Leone where they actually asked questions about how willing would you be to lend money uh, to people in the community and exactly whom and sort of measuring that at baseline and then later at end line and the reverse question on some level, who would you ask for money? So measuring these kind of um, uh, elements of trust and then also seeing the extent to which people participate in civic life. So do they attend parent-teacher association meetings? What kinds of activities are they engaging in that also seem to reflect some sense of the ways in which people are bound together? And so I think that's actually some of the work that I find the most exciting is thinking about, and again, it's not explicitly tied to rigorous impact evaluation, but I think these things sometimes go hand in hand and it's one contribution that different researchers are making, uh, but we see in a lot of rigorous impact evaluation is thinking how actually we're gonna measure this and it pushes us back to that theory of change that the program started with and thinking, how do we think the change works? And so I think the other thing I would pick up that uh, we're hearing across the panel is this question of what Jasper and Felipe earlier called the mechanism, how does it work? And thinking that impact evaluation is an important investment 
because it can take us beyond, did this program work? Did we get done what we wanted to do? Which is a very important question in and of itself to also how did that change happen and sort of how does that advance um, our understanding? And I guess one thing I'd say that is um, perhaps a little bit special about the way that JPL works is that it's trying to tie together the academic conversation about these issues, so what's getting published in academic journals with the policy conversation as well. So some of the conversation that we're having here today and sort of that decision makers need to decide what to implement by sort of saying we're learning more about how human behavior works. Um, in this case, it was about you know, the, the sort of theory of change identifying the, the assumption that there's some idea that people sort of have a, there's a personal resonance of the story when it's told by people who they can relate to. So trying to sort of pull that, uh, pull that out and then think how can we then apply that to other types of programming and test it in new ways. There's a few things to come back to. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I think uh, carrying on on that uh, grain, but also moving on to our next question in terms of trying to, to look at uh, why we would do this and what investment that it brings. Maybe Maria Luz, you could talk to us a little bit about uh, how do you advocate within your field for better evidence and trying to, to see how to use impact evaluation for that purpose? Um, well, my field is our field because uh, <laughs> so I don't I don't speak much because I'm the IOMer here and I think uh, so most of you guys know what we're doing because you're also uh, IOMers so. Um, to well to advocate uh, for impact evaluation, we always uh, go back to their benefits, and and I think and I I'm pretty new to the field of migration. Before that, I was in uh, other field, development, economics, and environment. So for me, um, discovering me, my it's a discovery of migration. I'm here for my technical skills in terms of impact evaluation and statistics and, um, and uh, experimental method to uh, address the impact of programs, but I'm very new to the field of migration and what I found highly interesting in using impact evaluation in the, within the field of migration is, I think if there is a field that desperately need evidence is migration because it's very politically sensitive, because there is a lot of opinion, because there is a lot of ideas, and, and we cannot uh, afford to, um, to to design programs and projects in migration on the basis of ideas, of preconceived ideas, of opinions, and we need evidence. And, um, and I think that's why in the particular field of migration nowadays, irregular migration all the more, we really need robust uh, impact evaluation. And uh, um, I would also add that what is also new for me is to work for a big international uh, organization uh, where I was working for JPAL at the time, so it's much smaller, and, uh, and for DIME, which is um, the World Bank, but it's a smaller unit. Um, and what I do see uh, we are doing, what I am doing when I'm doing impact evaluation for IOM, is that I'm bridging the world of HQ and the world of the, the, the mission and the field work where um, I think the very highly empirical nature of impact evaluation is itself a, a benefit because it gives um, us, which are some, um, somehow remote from the field, a very good sense of what is happening when you are implementing an impact evaluation. You have no no other choice but uh, you know to get there, to get to the field, to get to understand the reality uh, of um, the work on the field, and also the reality of the people you are going to work with. So I think this is an, an invaluable um, benefit for designing and for also advising policymaker in future, future uh, projects. Thank you. One of the, when we discussed a few weeks ago, one of the elements that we were talking about is also how to ensure that at the program level, there is a way that, that w when we're developing, designing, and implementing programs, we're thinking about how impact evaluation can be used and, and what is the, 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 the common ground. And I'd like to go back to our panelists to talk about, particularly maybe we'll start with you, Kristen, in terms of WFP, but how can we use or how does WFP use impact e evaluation 
to either complement or strengthen existing M&E systems you might have within your programs at, in, uh, at WFP. Mm. Um, so something to note right now is, is WFP is in the middle of implementing a new impact evaluation strategy. So it has, a, it has quite a long history of doing impact evaluation within the organization, but it was largely decentralized until this point. So right now we're kind of witnessing the evolution of that into something that's um, a, a bit more centralized so that we can harness a lot of demand that uh, already exists and kind of direct it into priority learning areas. Um, part of this strategy is the acknowledging that we need a lot more kind of capacity building and infrastructure building in-house. In and to be able to recognize that a lot of that already exists in the country offices. And so this is kind of where our monitoring data um, pops up. So the vision for the impact evaluation strategy moving forward is to really complement what we're doing with the routine monitoring activities that are already happening in the field as part of the reporting that must be done to either headquarters or to donors. So when we roll out, let's say, a baseline survey that we want to do the impact evaluation, um, the, the best case scenario is that we're just kind of hooking on to a survey that would have gone out anyway. And that we use that survey to you know, ask, make sure that we're asking the right questions. And we wouldn't tinker with it much other than you know, within that survey is this sort of randomization that, that happens. Um, there's already a wealth of information that exists in our country offices and, and that can be used for a, a variety of of things that are inherent in the impact evaluation process. So one that I'm thinking about right now is just using it for a sampling frame um, before you go in to really start understanding you know, the context that exists, knowing what questions that you, you should be asking based on the data that already exists. And there's this other point about uh, that was brought up earlier, which is the, the cost of an impact evaluation is large because of the data, right? That, that is a huge contributing factor th to that. If we want to do this well, and if we want a lot of country office buy-in, um, and if we want to prove the worth of the, of the cost of the impact evaluation, mm -hmm. then it's beneficial to us to find ways to lower that cost. Right? And so monitoring data and monitoring activities that are already ongoing, uh, if we can kind of hook onto that to not add any more costs, good monitoring data is, is one of the most logical ways of, of making impact evaluations cheaper. Thank you. Frida, I think I'll, I'll ask you a similar question, but I would like to talk a little bit. I'd like you to add a little bit more about the financial implications that I think came up in the earlier discussions as well about the cost benefit. And, and as this is also something that you are involved in, it would be interesting to, yeah. for you oh, to add that. We do cost analysis all the time, <laughs> <laughs> especially because now donors increasingly want value for money and already that definition is open to interpretation. What do we actually mean? Um, I think one thing we learned through impact evaluations is also the importance of the time dimension. Once you factor in time, especially when you deal with displaced populations. Uh, people that, as I said earlier, on average are displaced for 17 years. Mm -hmm. You have to reassess the overall cost of an intervention by IRC or the humanitarian sector in general. Um, we have developed, as some of you may be familiar with this tool called SCAN, a systematic cost analysis tool which is uh, also available on, uh, on the net and on the internet for free for everybody to use. Um, and it basically looks at the uh, cost of the intervention per unit. For example, in the case of a health intervention, we look not just at the, um, the basic service delivery, but also um, we look at important factors like the quality and the duration of the training, how we train health workers. And we found out by comparing different interventions that once you factor in the quality of the training, actually the cost per patient drops. So if you evaluate the whole intervention across the whole arc of the, the response, uh, there are similar and different and very sometimes surprising findings. Um, the most the cost effective intervention may be the longest. Um, and that also brings me to talk about 
the time dimension when it comes to research and evaluation. We now focus um, a research on multi-year um, endeavors um, on four different areas. Education in emergencies, cash in emergencies, under five mortality, reducing under five mortality and reducing family violence. Because through impact evaluations, we've come to learn that those are the four areas where research can actually have the highest impact, that has the potential for the highest benefit to our clients. Okay, thank you very much, thank you. Um, one of the elements that you mentioned, Kenyon, were some of the innovative approaches that you have within j -PAL, and I'd like to know if you could speak a little bit more about what you, what has already been put into place and the, that, that are used to, to address some of the challenges we might have in impact evaluation. Sure, it's a, it's a big question. Um, <laughs> maybe something I didn't mention was that uh, every evaluation that it, the JPL network is involved in starts with a partner organization. In some cases, that's governments, be it national governments or state governments. In other cases, it's uh, nonprofit organizations. Uh, and I think it also starts with a question, an evaluation question, which is sort of is the basis for that partnership, saying, you know, we think this works, we think this is an effective approach, but we'd like to know more, or we're interested in understanding whether one of two different approaches is more effective. Um, some of the conversations we've been having earlier look at sort of um, Kristen's question of sort of for whom, uh, who do we provide uh, the intervention to and how. So I think, I think that's the beginning, and when we talk about the complementarity of different research approaches, a lot of that initial analysis begins on, comes from monitoring data, it comes from administrative data in, in the cases of governments, looking a little bit at the data they already have and trying to learn more from it and think about how we frame the question. Uh, partly in going back to what a theory of change might look like um, and examining sort of whether we need to, to unpack it a little bit further, whether there's some sort of missing links that we haven't thought about and that we want to test in an evaluation. I think that's one very powerful tool. Um, another one is sort of various kinds of qualitative data, looking at uh, people's understanding of the, the processes behind how some of these programs run, where they think uh, they're most effective and understanding things there. Um, understanding better who the population that, that's involved in the program actually is. Um, and things like, you know, we were talking about earlier, sort of how many people are going to show up at the screening, trying to understand that a little bit um, and what people's behaviors are so that you can structure the evaluation accordingly. Um, and then I think at the other end, trying to then understand, uh, and I think this is where there's actually a lot of work to be done, but it's really exciting work, is once you have the results of an impact evaluation, what do we do with those and how do we think about how those generalize? So earlier we mentioned external validity. Um, I think thinking through that carefully, what were the assumptions that were in place on why this program ran the way it did in the place that it did and how do other contexts look like that or how do they differ? Um, so one thing that just comes to mind from our conversation earlier was relatively high uh, baseline assumptions of what risk looks like, which is interesting. So it might be different to think about how this program would work in an area where people had very low baseline understanding of what the risk was and sort of thought there's zero risks at all. Uh, how would this program need to be adapted and sort of what would that look like? So I think that's part of it. And then also just thinking, you know, impact evaluation can often be quite dense. Uh, we learned about the annex to this report being 60 or 70 pages. How do you actually digest that material and think, how do I then feed this back into program design, particularly if I'm not someone who just wants to zoom into the tables? Um, and then I, that's where I think JPAL and IPA or Innovations for Poverty Action, other organizations like this are investing, and many uh, governments and international organizations themselves are investing in sort of saying, okay, how do we sit down and think about what are the many ways in which this makes us probably rethink some of the assumptions we had going into other kinds of programs. So I think that's a, that's a, it's a lot of work and we shouldn't assume that it just gets done once an impact evaluation is sort of published. Mm -hmm. In some sense, that's the beginning of another stage of kind of thinking what types of adaptation do we now need to build into the rest of our programs. And often, uh, you know, what's the, the new study that we run? So how do we then run this against the effectiveness? Coming back to these questions of, of cost analysis, how do we run this against other programs and think about where our money should best be invested? Okay, thank you. That's an excellent point about the usage and again, an element that comes up not just obviously in impact evaluation, but in any type of research or evaluation. What are we doing with all of this rich data and these, these reports and how do we actually turn it into, into uh, uh, good implementation and, and, and learning for all of us. Um, I'm going to stop with some of my questions and give a chance for those who are online or in the room 
to, to ask a few questions as well. Um, yes, please go yeah, ahead. Following on from, thanks for all your really interesting insights. Um, following on from that point, I'm really um, thinking about the burden that's placed on people accessing services and support to partake in these types of surveys and feedback uh, groups. And what, uh, to the panel, what can we do as a sector to try and alleviate some of that burden, burden in the way that we share our findings, our research, our data, and thinking about how these communities are revisited by numerous organizations asking similar questions. Okay. Is there someone that would like to start tackling that with the experience of what you might have done? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, this is, goes right to the core of what um, Diana was talking about. We seem to be um, learning the same thing over and over again. So at some point you have to wonder why doesn't the learning translate into policy? That's, it's, I'm not sure that the challenge is to find out what our clients think. Often, very often, we already know what they're going to tell us. The issue is why isn't this learning translating, informing policies? And that's where I think the advocacy plays a key role because we have to make sure that um, policy makers, decision makers, not only listen but actually act on what they listen. And that's where you know we, we usually face political, more political barriers. So yeah, thank you for raising that point. I mean, we, we have an internal team um, that we call client responsiveness team, and um, they come across this issue all the time. It's like you know the, the population, our groups are tired of being interviewed, and even if you give them food, you know, mm -hmm. some other kind of incentive, they won't show up at these community meetings, because it's a four-hour community meeting. You have the leader opening up, the ceremony, and all that. I mean, these people have to work, and if they don't work, they've got to be at home uh, looking after their kids. How can, you, can we expect them to tell us over and over again what they need? It's not that, I'm not saying that we already know what they need, because that's a major <laughs> assumption. All I'm saying is that at some point, all this information needs to be acted upon. And why isn't this happening? Again, the why question. You know, we, we may know what is happening or not. So why isn't this translating into effective response, effective policy? Yes. Maybe I could just say briefly, I think that sort of question of sort of how do we use this information, uh, reporting back results I think is important. It's, it's often a challenge to think what's the best way to frame this information, particularly the 70 page annex. But I think sort of where you can build in structures, and I guess this is a lesson maybe particularly for relevant for international organizations, where you can build in structures to actually then adapt programs relatively quickly and sort of say we're introducing a change. This is why we've made this change. We believe it's going to be more effective. I think that's part of the answer is in saying better programming comes from having had good results, whether they're positive or negative, and you may be learning that you need to scale back a program. It's not always going to involve building it up. But I think uh, some of the most powerful examples we have from within the network are when something started as a pilot project, it got early promising results, there was some adaptation, it was run again at scale in a different way, then it was perhaps adapted and replicated in other contexts. And then you sort of have this snowball approach of something where you're trying to understand how it works. And I think the answer is, yes, the results, you know, this is why the study worked the way it did, but it's even more so in the actual implementation than saying the programs now run differently because it's more effective this way and then continuing to evaluate. But also, uh, just to intervene very quickly on, on this, uh, we are now um, having this uh, project of pulling together the results of uh, several research uh, uh, impact evaluations uh, to avoid this, to avoid response fatigue and also because we are sitting on all this primary data which is uh, costly uh, to collect and it's super interesting and it's primary data and we use them for uh, one report and then it sort of goes somewhere in a hard drive and IOM is full of those kind of data. 
And so we want to pull it together and so also maybe it could be possible for us to exploit more, much more this data that we already have. So that's what we are now trying to do um, is out of all the study we are going to do in the impact evaluation unit to, call, to have them as, use them as secondary data. That's for one, uh, so it also reduces respondent fatigue, it's um, also a way to have secondary analysis without investing again uh, in data collection and also it sort of, it, it could help to sort the external validity question which is crucial to impact evaluation because it's true for now and for there but if we have pretty similar um, studies that we are running in different countries and we are able somehow to pull all that data set into one then we can maybe generalize a little bit more what we find for Senegal or what we find for for Guinea, so, and if we think we can collaborate between different international institutions and put all our data together, I'm sure there is a lot there um, that we can uh, dig without having to harass <laughs> people in villages somewhere. Or, or drive them with food. Yeah, exactly, or drive them with food. <laughs> Maybe before, I, can I jump to the webinar to see if there's anyone who has a question, then I'll go back to the audience. Uh, sure, there's a question from Sophie. Uh, thank you for the presentation and panel for providing the opportunity to join remotely. Building on the point raised about how evidence is used and applied, I would like to ask the panelists whether they can provide some examples of how impact evaluations have informed their programming. I can start with that. Oh, please, great. Do we want to do a few can we questions? Can we take a few sure. questions and then come back to the panel? That's fine. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, so thank you very much. It's a really interesting discussion. I mean, I think the first part of the departure is always to create uh, awareness within international organizations and within governments that rigorous evaluation is important. Now, we have some panelists here that actually have created this unit in the international organizations, and I was wondering what advice you could give on how to create units like that and how to create that awareness. And similarly, Kilian, I don't know if you've worked with governments to create similar units. I mean, we know the British government has this behavioral insights team, um, but there are many governments who don't have that approach. So I don't know if you, as JPL, have experience um, with that. And then I'll, I'll just take one more question and I'll go back. It's actually more a comment on the question. Okay. Uh, but just a uh, very little while ago, we had a very big meeting down at the Graduate Institute. Uh, where the International Network for Education and Emergencies and NORA got together uh, to talk about data management and data sharing. Uh, and I think a lot of the focus was also on, and that's an INI initiative as well, uh, on trying to find ways in which we can harmonize our indicators. Uh, because if we go and, uh, you know, we run higher education programs in the field, uh, so if we want to triangulate the data that we've collected in, in the spirit of uh, really very, very, uh, you know, low data harvesting thresholds. Uh, we don't find the quality data uh, in the field from m &E, uh, output that would allow us to triangulate. So, you know, we have no choice but to go back in. So my question to you is, you know, how, how would you approach that uh, in terms of research ethics uh, in fragile context? Uh, you know, kinds of guidelines that we, we should be abiding by, but also in terms of the data sharing uh, and, the, and obviously all the data regulations that prevent us in many ways from sharing. Thank you. Kristen, did you want to... Sure. Um, just to provide kind of one example, obviously <coughs> since we're the World Food Program, we work a lot in the area of nutrition. We're very lucky to have a department at WFP, a nutrition department, that is very already quite interested in, in evidence. And there's a, a very clear incentive there, right? Nobody wants to be bad at their job. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it, it makes sense that you would want to use as much evidence as you can to improve uh, as much as you can. Uh, before I arrived at WFP, there was a, a series of impact evaluations, which is also confusingly abbreviated as MAM. Uh, but it's uh, moderate and acute malnutrition, um, which was done, as I said, as part of a series, and so it was done across um, a, a few countries in the Sahel um, to kind of get at what are some common lessons that we can learn that would really inform not only the country programming, 
but would have some broader lessons that this department at, at headquarters could build on. And it actually parallels a lot with what we're seeing in this MAM, which is that uh, there, were, there were some results that were almost immediately actionable. And so the <coughs> nutrition department has responded by saying um, it's, it, it's clear from this research that this kind of peer-to-peer -peer approach for behavior change seems to be largely you know, effective for trying to uh, understand how to best encourage better nutrition for families for children. So they're taking uh, that approach from, not, from moving forward in more countries. And uh, also to build on kind of the digital aspect of it, so um, mobile phone aspect. So they are building better monitoring systems, also to your point, um, to kind of make sure that when they go back to these countries in the future that they have much better data. And these uh, cell phones are collecting basically you know, visit data for um, healthcare checkups and, and things that the person themselves is information that the person themselves is, is volunteering as data. But it's a good way to track, you know, how much are people relying on our services, how much do people actually uh, benefit from from WP, WFP's interventions and, and using that data to inform future programming in other countries. So it had, you know, certainly that series um, taught us a lot about how we want to do impact evaluations. Um, but it also still has some effects that you can see in the in the organization. Perfect. Thanks for that. Kevin, do you want to answer? Yeah, I think on the on that first question of sort of uh, in terms of working with governments and how to set up an evidence partnership, at the very outset of the relationship, I don't think we have a lot of insight to how it start or how to sort of create it because. I think if you don't care about the effectiveness of your programs, it's going to be difficult to set up an impact evaluation unit and go there. And I think a lot of that happens on partly uh, sort of single change agents, people who sort of say, we should be asking more of a question. Or it comes from some dissemination of perhaps negative results. There's a sense that we're doing something that's a bit like this project, which appears to not work at all and some pressure. So I think from at the outset of the process, we probably don't have a lot of insight of how things happen. I think when, in, in terms of moving forward, it often starts on a little bit about what Marie Luce is talking about, thinking about the data you already have and ways of using it more responsibly and sort of engaging different uh, sort of professors or, or, or maybe uh, even students to kind of think about uh, what's the data we have and what story does that already tell for us, uh, tell us? Um, and one thing that, that JPAL and that IPA have often done is sort of just placing someone, embedding someone whose uh, focus is on actually thinking about what that data is, thinking about how it can be used, and also thinking about what small changes could be made in the way that data is currently being collected that would allow us to use it much more powerfully. So is there some way that we could uh, sort of either be cleaning it or standardizing the way in which we're bringing in this information that would really improve quality with actually a small marginal change? And then I think from there, sort of setting up sometimes labs with governments that say we have a question or an area that we're particularly interested in. Um, I think of JPAL and IPA partnered with the education ministry in Peru in particular, um, or in India, there's a strong partnership with the government of Tamil Nadu at state level to say we're going to evaluate a huge range of programming in this area. We're also just going to think a lot about what monitoring and evaluation actually means in this sort of government unit and sort of how we can learn to do it better and when and when not impact evaluation is going to be the best way forward and then sort of I think kind of getting more energy to actually drive that into a, a cycle where you're both before you start a program drawing on the existing evidence base to say what's clear that I shouldn't be doing what are some ideas about what I might be doing and then pilot sort of innovating and piloting and, and then sort of running this kind of cycle of innovation and evaluation so I think at the very outset, we're not exactly sure, but once you sort of have that start that says, okay, we'd like to learn more about the way in which we're programming, that's one way to start it. We are close to running out because I know there's still another presentation, but can someone tackle the question about data sharing? Because I think it's a very valuable question. Is there anybody that? Yeah, yes, I mean, I think I would like to make a broader uh, comment about data sharing and uh, just data management, knowledge management. I think uh, to go back to what I was saying earlier, we are living in an age where there's just too much information out there. And even if we do a great job with impact evaluations, uh, the reality is that they're going to sit on a shelf or in a hard drive uh, very soon. And we're not going to go back there. So. Uh, in IRC and I think in the humanitarian sector, I think it is indispensable to hire and design a sort of new role that is the one of the knowledge broker. 
the impact evaluation, the book, the toolbox, the toolkit is not going to do the trick. It's not a database that's going to find the magic solution to this problem. It's the people curating content and digesting, in a way, all this information into something that you can communicate to the busy politician. I mean, you think the elevator pitch is a parody? It isn't. I have been in elevators with ministers who literally had 20 seconds to hear my key message, and at that moment, I have to be quick with killer facts, with you know the key message. I, I have to look confident and sound confident, and for that, I don't have the time to do the research work. I need someone in my organization that will talk to me and give me the rationale for, uh, for the argument I'm gonna make in that elevator. I think the knowledge brokering is absolutely key. Then we can go to the technical side, the legalistic aspect of things and discuss how we're gonna share information. But to me, that's already like a, an, an idealistic scenario. Before even getting to that challenge, which exists, I would like to know how are we gonna manage all of this? How are we gonna manage impact evaluations? I'm going to uh, turn that around, because actually you've taken the word right out of my mouth. Okay. I want to ask one <laughs> final question for just a, a short answer from each of you. For those who might still be a bit un in, uh, not convinced or unclear, is there one piece of advice or one pitch that you can give to them, each of you, just to, to keep them engaged and interested in taking this forward? I'll start with you since yes. you were. <laughs> um, yeah, I think uh, evidence-based policy and advocacy really works. Once you're able to sit down with uh, the busy politician, um, the uh, skeptical, cynical bureaucrat and actually show them that what you're saying is documented and builds on uh, reliable, rigorous evidence, they're going to be ready to listen. And if you can really summarize it in 10 or fewer points, it's so much the better. Perfect. Thank you. Marius? Yeah. Um, I would say don't be um, sort of afraid of the cost. As an economist, I'd say you always have to look at the opportunity cost you're saving and think of you implementing a program or a project that doesn't work. It's going to cost way more and I don't need to do the survey to tell you that it's going to cost way more than this evaluation you are investing in. And this evaluation has many uh, positive spillover anyways. So you can only win by uh, doing a rigorous evaluation of your project. Thank you. Yeah, I would just say that with the experience that we have so far, I think one of the, the encouraging lessons that we've learned is really that there are incentive structures that already exist for impact evaluation. There are donors that are already asking for it for reasons of accountability, but also for learning you know, what, what it is that they next want to fund. That demand um, from programmers, you know, people who are really on on the field, de demand for this evidence already exists, and people. There's a wealth of information and a wealth of experience in all of our countries, um, and, and people want to be able to prove that they are thought leaders in, in what it is that they do, and so it just takes that kind of small, well, in our case, small team, in other cases, not so small, um, to really kind of be the conduit for that demand and for those incentives and be the advocate that's kind of bridging those um, those two things. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, I'll make one practical and then we'll be yes. one broader argument. The practical one I think is that impact evaluations, once you have sort of strong evidence, are a huge way to unlock resources. Uh, over 400 million people have been directly touched by a program that was uh, evaluated by JPAL researchers, and that's not because those programs started at scale, it's because they started small, showed promise of effectiveness, and then were scaled up uh, over time. And then I think the sort of broader point I'd make, slightly more idealistic perhaps, or, or a little bit less, maybe not cynical, but practical, is just that there's a wealth of information that you can learn. And I think with a well-designed impact evaluation, you just sort of can uncover quite a wealth of insight, and that's useful both in terms of the program itself, but also sort of broader thinking about how development works or any program. Thank you very much. Thank you for taking the time and joining us, and thank you.